No secret here, attempts across the state have routinely reached well into the triple digits this summer. Some advocates say it's yet another indication that Texas prisons need some type of basic cooling system. This weekend, the Lioness Organization and Statewide Leadership Council will hold a vigil and prayer rally in Gatesville, where there's a rather large woman's facility. Right now, these groups think dozens of inmate deaths from the summer months could be linked to the heat, although the state disputes that. Only about 30% of state prison facilities right now have AC. It makes it sound like it's a luxury. It's not a luxury. Uh, so we're, we're asking for the temperatures to be between 65 and 85 degrees. Certainly, certainly wouldn't be considered luxury uh, to be sitting in 85 degrees, uh, but, you know, we, we need temperature control so that we don't have these dangerous temperatures that we're seeing. Now, during the past legislative session, a bill pushing for millions in AC funding for prisons made it through the Texas House, but it stalled out in the state Senate. More details on that bill in this weekend's demonstration at KXXV.com. And Kempner Water Supply says that the work to open a lower intake in Stillhouse Hollow Lake is taking longer than expected. The project should now be complete by the middle of next week. As we first reported to you, people living in Kempner and surrounding towns have been under stage four water restrictions since a leak shut off water service for days there. All right, let's get a first check of our weather this evening. Chief Meteorologist Matt Hines is here. Matt, no triple digits yesterday. Today, we got there just in the nick of time at about 4.51 this afternoon. It hit 100 degrees officially, and a lot of folks, even out west, already getting into those triple digits as well. Amarillo, Lubbock, Midland, San Angelo, Abilene, all the way down into South Texas. Houston was 104 yesterday. They got down to a 99 today, and it was 96 in DFW. Here at home, again, 100 degrees even. Waco, Temple, Colleen, Gatesville, 101 in Hillsboro. So we had the triple digits today. They really take off as we head into tomorrow around here. And as we take a look at what we are tracking for you temperature-wise right now, it's not to 98 degrees in Waco. Not a big cool off there. 99 in Temple. 100 still in Colleen. Lots of 100s. 101s west of I-35. A few 100s down to the southeast and some mid-90s off toward the east. Now, we have had some pretty dry air in place with dew points in the 40s and 50s, so that will allow temperatures to fall off again for tonight. So another pleasant evening and then it all changes tomorrow. The excessive heat warning is back, and that's likely going to continue into the weekend. Also have to keep an eye on the tropics, possibly, and we'll talk about that coming up. I just spoke with her, and I pray God forgives them, that she repents, and she becomes a better person. That was, of course, Vanessa Gann's mother at the sentencing trial earlier this week. The family finally getting some closure with the only person left to hold accountable for the murder of Gian. That's right. And with all the tragedy surrounding Vanessa Gian, I wanted to take the chance to highlight the hero she was and the positive impact her legacy has had in this week's Faces of Fort Cavazos. Say hello to Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen, a proud soldier who last served at what is now Fort Cavazos. Before calling Central Texas home, she was a young woman from Houston. She was very, um, I guess the term would be like tomboyish. She always uh, wanted to do something outdoors, never inside. And um, it was very fun. It was always some adventure she would take us to and someone would end up getting hurt. As she grew older, her love of soccer grew stronger, spending a lot of her free time on the field. She wouldn't only play for the school, but also outside league, outside leagues. Um, she would play what they call indoor soccer. She would play anything she could get her hands on. Um, she would do it even if it took her all day. Uh, sometimes she would even play three games back to back. Which is why her family was surprised when she told them she was joining the United States Army and not pursuing a professional soccer career. She came home and, and said, um, I signed up to, to join the Army and we were all kind of in shock. But at the same time, I kind of understood why she did it. She, she, she told me straight up saying, I don't need an office job. That's not me. I don't want to sit at a desk. Tragically, Vanessa's life was taken, but her light shined bright as protests for justice swept the nation. Those protests and the perseverance of her family led to major changes in how the military deals with sexual assault and harassment in their ranks. I feel like she really did give 
the door to those that felt like they could never talk about such things, whether it be, you know, suicide, what leads up to suicide, whether it be sexual assault, harassment, um, medical malpractice stuff. Though Vanessa is no longer with us, Myra has a message for the sister she says continues to serve her country every day. I hope that she's proud to see everything that we've been able to do in her honor. Um, and I just ask her, you know, to, to keep us going, uh, help us, help her, help others, because at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. Yeah, such a tragic story, such a tragic end, but she definitely left her mark on Fort Cavazos and the entire nation. It's amazing the impact that she has been able to have, even though she's not here. Yes. And a lot of that has to do with her family and being able to raise the awareness that they did and not giving up. And they have spark change. And I, I'll tell you what, they are not giving up anytime soon. No, I saw Myra today posted on Twitter, well, X now, that she said, I'm really going to remember you, Vanessa, in a positive light from here on out. Yes, and it is amazing to see the heroes we have and to get a chance to highlight Vanessa again as one of the heroes of this community is why we do Faces of Fort Cavazos. Exactly. Thanks, Adam. Well, on Maui, Cavadier dogs are still searching for missing people today. Makeshift morgues are now being shipped in as well as that death toll continues to rise. The latest after the break. Ocean water in the Gulf of Mexico is the hottest on record. That is according to the Washington Post. We are approaching peak hurricane season and warmer water can intensify hurricanes and tropical storms. The intense heat stretches across the whole Gulf Coast with Houston recording its hottest period ever. No question about it. It is warm in the water down there. Yeah, the waters are very warm. And again, that's just one element that can create. So you have to have the right upper level conditions as well for tropical systems. And it looks like as we head into next week and the last week of August, we may start to see, see a little something. more tropical activity. So I do think that is going to be something that we're going to keep an eye on. But until then, well, we're keeping an eye on more 100s. 43 days now of 100 plus degree heat. And yes, today marks day one of uh, probably several more to come here across the region. Hopefully not a streak of 29 in a row, but we'll see. Our excessive heat warning is back. Waco, Temple, Colleen, and all of Central Texas included in the excessive heat warning from I-45 back to San Saba, Dallas-Fort Worth down to Austin, Bryan College Station down to Houston. We're all in it, folks, and it looks like we're going to continue to see a forecast fire danger as well in that very high to extreme category with that heat returning. Winds will be about 5 to 15 miles per hour, so that'll be at least a little bit lower, but it is going to be very hot and dry across the region. 106 for tomorrow, which would tie a record high. 107 Friday, probably staying just under the record, and then we're going to be close to records again Saturday and Sunday before dropping back off by the middle part of next week as the heat dome shifted a little bit, but now it's starting to reestablish itself here over the South Central Plains. It's going to be here through the weekend. That's going to keep the heat going, blocking any thunderstorm activity from getting into our area as well. But as I said, and as that was just mentioned, the Gulf of Mexico waters are very warm. And as we head into next week, the National Hurricane Center has already put a 20% chance of tropical development. Now, it can be anything from a tropical depression into a tropical storm or a hurricane. Right now, it looks like it'll be on the weaker side. But it could move toward Texas, so that's something we would keep an eye on. Our Syntex roof systems cam right now in Waco. It's hot, 98 degrees, feeling like 96, with east winds at 7 miles per hour. And looking at our future track, things are quiet around here all the way through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. There's just no change. It's just going to be plain old hot here across the region. But notice there's moisture and a little disturbance gathering here across the eastern parts of the Gulf of Mexico. By Sunday, that's going to start to move farther to the west as we get into Monday and Tuesday. And exactly where does it go? This is the American model. It is tracking this more to the south across South Texas, then going up into West Texas as we head into the middle part of the week. There is another model, the European model, that brings it over. I'll show you that coming up here in another weather segment, and it is a little more optimistic for rain here across our region, so something to track as we head into next week. So tonight, temperatures will be pleasant. Once again, upper 60s, low to mid 70s across the region. This morning was the official low of 66 degrees. I hope you enjoyed that because here we go. 
104 to 108 as we head into tomorrow, and it doesn't get any better for the rest of the week. 107 on Friday, 106 Saturday, 107 Sunday, 105 Monday. So that's where the streak will continue. And right now, I'm going to err on the side of caution and keep it hot and mainly dry as we move through next week. However, if something tropical forms in the Gulf of Mexico and happens to move our way, this could change a little bit across our area as we head into the middle part of next week. All right, Matt, well, go ahead and look here. You can actually see tourists taking refuge in a Maui pool as that fire burns all around them. Maui's death toll now topping 100. New security camera video appears to show a power line spark igniting the flames. Gloria Pasmino has the latest. A cadaver dog's bark punctuates the painstaking search and recovery efforts in the ashes of Maui's burn zones. You just have to work through it. If we don't do our job, then the families can't get any closure. Closure for many survivors and families will end at a morgue facility like this one in Wailuku. National mortuary and victim identification experts have arrived to assist local coroners. If you're lucky in a circumstance like this, you get to see fingerprints. Governor Josh Green says DNA will be key to identify most fire victims and could take weeks. This is much like you see in a war zone or what we saw with 9-11. No official cause for the fire has been released yet. But new security camera video out Wednesday from a Maui bird sanctuary appears to show a power line spark, then flames erupting, the same night the deadly blazes were ignited. Officials say it was not near Lahaina or Kula, but may illustrate one possible cause. While the fire is ignited, we measured 122 individual faults on the utility grid any one of which could be, you know, produce a similar uh, result to what you see on that video. Some survivors say the government's response is still lacking. It's been an obvious sign of neglect, um, especially with the resources that the United States has. In many cases, it's locals helping each other. Watch what these people, this strength of this community can do because, like, they're already on it. Reporting in Lahaina, Gloria Pasmino. Coming up, you might end up saying when pigs fly for the ne next story, but it is true. Doctors have successfully transplanted, transplanted a pig kidney into a person. We'll explain. Next time you step outside, say hi to your neighbor. Could actually help boost your overall well-being. A new Gallup poll says people who regularly chat with neighbors have a higher well-being than those who don't. Adults should, act, should aim to talk to six people to positively impact their physical, financial, career, and community health. And dogs with social time with both people and other animals are healthier than those without it. A study from the University of Washington and Texas A&M says that the effect of social interaction was five times more than anything else they compared it to, like as family finances, household children, or the dog's parents' age. Well, surgeons at New York University say a genetically edited pig's kidney that they transplanted into a patient has been functioning successfully for more than a month now. ABC's Justin Finch has more. At New York University's Langone Health Center, what could be a glimpse into the future of organ transplants. The pig kidney appears to replace all of the important tasks that the human kidney manages. On July 14th, NYU surgeons transplanted a pig's immune response regulating thymus gland and a single pig's kidney into a brain dead patient whose heartbeat is supported by a ventilator. Researchers say that kidney has continued to function successfully for more than 30 days. That kidney harvested from a pig specifically bred to eliminate a gene known to prompt human immune systems to reject pig organs. The research team continuing to track the patient's progress. This study is ongoing and we have authorization to continue for a total of two months. The NYU researchers say their findings could help address a growing disparity between available organs and patients needing transplants. 
The U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration estimating more than 100,000 Americans are on Oregon wait lists, with a new person added every 10 minutes and roughly 17 patients awaiting transplants dying daily. Being part of a potentially life-saving medical innovation compelled the family of 57-year-old Maurice Miller to donate his body for this research. I can say with confidence that he would be proud of the fact that in the tragedy of his death, his legacy will be helping many people live. NYU's Langone Center has performed at least two other pig kidney surgeries before. The Food and Drug Administration has yet to sign off on living human trials, but this latest procedure could bring them closer to an approval. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. Practices keep on going for high school football prep. Even in the heat, and scrimmages have begun for our local teams as we are getting closer to red zone. And when we return, our next stop on the road to red zone is back-to-back 4A state champs, the China Spring Cougars. Last season, China Spring football was crowned state champions for the second year in a row. The Cougars are back on the field getting ready for this season. 25 sports sacre Shaji Adam is there. The China Spring Cougars are back on the football field. Last season, the Cougars went 15-1 and and were crowned back-to-back state champions, a near-perfect season that can still be built off of. You know, I think you use it as a lot of experience. You know, we, we were down in a lot of games, um, had a battle for the entirety of a game, and so being able to, the adversity c- coming back from that has been huge for us. Um, Last year we lost a game that our kids weren't used to doing. And so I think it shows a lot of things to the younger guys of, hey, things aren't always going to go as we plan. Um, It's the battle and the relentless effort. Quite a number of seniors graduated from last season's championship team. With fresh faces on the field, the Cougars know it will be an adjustment. Just kind of do everything right. Just max effort every time you can. Just be more with the team than with yourself. That's what I think it means. It's interesting to see the dynamic of a locker room and a team atmosphere with a whole bunch of new guys. And it shows that, hey, we've got some things we got to build on. Um, allows guys to lead the locker room, allows those upperclassmen and those returners to kind of show the younger guys the ropes of this is how we act when we travel. This is what the weight room looks like. These are the expectations that we do not deviate from. They got to see those new Cougars in action as China Spring took on Franklin in their first scrimmage. We're just trying to play fast, not really think about what we're doing, just go out there and just play fast every play and try to be good. You know, they're an extremely, extremely tough opponent. You know, obviously in two days we're not game planning towards anybody, but the type of offense and the physicality that they bring on both sides of the football is really good for us to kind of set the tone of the season of gauging where we are, what we need to work on, and obviously with a high caliber program like that, it gives us some confidence when we do have success. The Cougars will begin their season against the Lorena Leopards on the road on August 25th. Reporting from China Spring High, Shaji Adam, 25 Sports. And here's a look at what's ahead in the next 30 minutes of the show tonight. Ever heard of going to school in the forest? One local elementary is trying it, or more on the farm. <laughs> Plus, it's been one year since the Inflation Reduction Act passed. Some think it's working, others not so much. Summer vacation, that's in the past for most of the kiddos here in Central Texas. And for one local school, their students had some new friends when they came back to campus. 25 News reporter Alicia Nespreto has details. It is time to head back to school, and here in Lorena at the Summit School, there was so much more than just some textbooks and paper waiting for the kids when they started on their first day. It was like unique because Travis with all of the goats and other animals would like just come up to me and just like start harassing me and sometimes like don't leave. Peyton Coleman and her classmates met Travis the donkey and five new goats on their first day of school. I'm very like clever with animals because sometimes they just go like they just like like me. Call it a love love relationship. Being a student at Summit School means she gets to spend a lot of time with them. 
The kids are responsible for feeding the animals, taking care of the animals, making sure that they're fed. They'll go in and change the chicken coop, um, collect the eggs. And so every kid pre-K and up has at least an hour of farm tours a week to make sure that the property is taken care of. It's all a part of their far school program where 70 students will learn to work with animals, garden and take care of nature. We learn about animals. We learn about nature. It's just lots of different things we learn about from nature. School staff says this can help the children grow in all aspects of their life. We focus on whole child, mind, body, and spirit. And part of the animals is also taking personal responsibility. And so all of that encompasses to really allow the child to develop skills that they can't get in a traditional classroom that they can then take out in their real life. Students say the best part, having so much fun while learning all of these lessons. She also really loves getting petted and attention. It was a really exciting first day of school here at the Summit School, and both the students and the staff say they are so excited to see what the rest of the year has to offer. And Lorena Alicia Nespardo, 25 News. All right, let's go ahead and get another look at the forecast. It's hot, Todd, and the heat dome is going to be moving right back over central Texas once again. Took a little hiatus over the past 24 to 36 hours. Now it's coming right back over central Texas once again, and it's going to hang out here all weekend long. So this isn't going to be going away anytime soon. Now, there is a 20% chance of tropical development in the Gulf of Mexico as we head into next week. That's still relatively low. Models still trying to figure out how this is all going to come into play. I showed you the American model earlier. Now I'm going to show you the European model. This is the one we want, folks. It has this disturbance developing in the Gulf of Mexico off near the Florida coast by Sunday evening. And then it will slowly make its way off toward the west. So as we head toward 5 p.m. on Monday, we're still hot and dry here. But notice the American model had this a lot farther south. This one is a lot farther to the north. It continues to work its way back to the west. And look at that. By Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, this model, not the forecast, but the model says that we could be seeing the potential of some tropical moisture here in central Texas. Right now, I'm going to go with the drier and hotter side just because that's where we've been. And it's hard to break this cycle. But... There is a little glimmer of hope. We need to see consistency, though, and we need other models to jump on board with this. And then we could change the forecast as we head into next week. But until then, we're going to keep those hundreds for now, but keep an eye on it. A controversial law passed by the Texas legislature is facing a legal challenge before it takes effect in a few weeks. The measure would ban gender-affirming care for children. Michael Atkinson reports. A lawsuit against the controversial ban on gender treatment for minors was considered all but inevitable. Even the bill's author, Senator Donna Campbell, issued a statement last month saying she had anticipated a legal pushback. But now, just weeks before that law takes effect, enforcement of the measure could be in jeopardy. Imagine you are receiving medical care. You're doing well. And all of a sudden you're told, wait, we actually have to stop. Even though every doctor you have seen and every major medical association has supported this law. Governor Greg Abbott signed the measure known as Senate Bill 14 into law back in June. The ACLU filed the lawsuit the next month, but the controversy and the pushback goes back much further than that. We saw clinics closing, doctors fearing that their license would be stripped from them and parents truly having a crisis on their hands. Attorneys for the state declined to do an interview with us, but they begin laying out their case late this afternoon with the bulk of their argument expected tomorrow. Today, the plaintiffs suing the state presented several doctors and parents of trans kids to tell the court about gender treatment what implementing SB 14 would mean for them. And this conversation is one that's being had nationwide. Several Republican-led states have passed policies like SB 14, bans on gender-related treatment for minors, and many have faced similar legal battles. It plays well with uh, sectors of the conservative base within the Republican Party. And some of those cases have resulted in injunctions, much as plaintiffs are calling for here in Austin. Coming up later tonight, teachers are embracing AI in the classroom this fall. So to come, we'll tell you how they're using it as a learning tool for students. Today, President Biden is celebrating one year of the anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act, a key piece of it. Scripps News' Haley Bull has the latest. When I think climate, I think jobs. That's the future. It's been one year since President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law. The sweeping spending bill, originally dubbed the Build Back Better bill, was a cornerstone of Biden's presidential campaign. 
It aimed to boost manufacturing and investments in clean power while bringing down prices for health care and energy, in part through tax incentives. Now the president and members of his cabinet are fanning out across the U.S. to tout the investments a year after its passage. President Biden in Wisconsin this week said Americans can already see the impacts from his economic agenda. According to Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, my plan is leading to a boom, they call a boom in manufacturing and manufacturing investment, as you're seeing right here in this factory. Over 13.4 million new jobs, 150,000 new jobs in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> Nearly 800,000 new manufacturing jobs nationwide. Although inflation is lower than it was a year ago, economists say it's not clear that the IRA is responsible. It's really difficult to say whether the Inflation Reduction Act actually contributed to the reduction we've seen in inflation. And it's because we live in a dynamic economy and lots of things have changed over the course of the last 12 months. Clark and other economists credit lower gas prices and the Federal Reserve increasing interest rates with helping to tackle record high inflation. They also point to the untangling of supply chains after COVID. That's one area where the White House says the IRA has helped lower inflation. As the supply chains have gotten back to normal, goods inflation has tracked them pretty closely one to one, come, come way down. So it's one of the reasons why inflation is much improved because of the unsnarling of supply chains. It's a reminder of the importance of those investments. But President Biden seemed to admit he wished he called it something else, telling an audience at a fundraiser in Park City, Utah last week, quote, I wish I hadn't called it that because it has less to do with reducing inflation than it does to do with dealing with providing for alternatives that generate economic growth. Still, administration officials credit the legislation with helping lower costs, for instance, on prescription drugs, major job growth, and a boom in manufacturing. And officials say there have already been more than $110 billion in private sector investments in clean energy manufacturing since the bill was signed. Specifically, the White House highlights investments of $10 billion in the solar industry, $64 billion.